Welcome to another episode. Today, we're gonna play with Lego. Hey, Stefan here, I hope you're doing well. Today, it's not just about playing with Lego, even though that would be kind of nice. Anyway, we're talking about aperture and depth of field. Now, as most of you will know, aperture is the opening in the iris that lets light onto the sensor. So the bigger the opening is, the bigger the aperture is, the more light gets in. The smaller that aperture is, the less light gets onto the sensor in the same amount of time. And that influences our depth of field. Again, the general rule is, the bigger the opening is, the bigger the aperture, the shallower the depth of field is. Or, if we have a small aperture, we increase our depth of field. So, I thought today we'd dive in a little bit deeper, play a little bit with LEGO, look at this whole game between aperture and depth of field, and because I'm an unapologetic geek, let's do some maths as well. When we talk about aperture, we have to start with f-stops or f-numbers. On your camera, you might also find other numbers. These may be half or third stops to fine tune an exposure, but let's just focus on the full f-stops for now. Let's take this made up PS Quickie lens, for example, and start at its widest aperture of f1.4. As we step down from 1.4 to 2.0, a full stop, the area of our aperture is reduced to half the previous size, and therefore allowing only half the amount of light to enter the camera. Now going from 2.0 to 2.8, the area is yet again half the size, and with it, the amount of light that our sensor can capture. The same applies to every following full f-stop, going to f4, 5.6, f8, and so on. Now, before we go into further detail, let's quickly revisit the subject of exposure for a second. As we discussed in last week's episode, taking this simple illustration of a DSLR camera, the light is entering the camera through the lens and iris and is then reflected by the mirror through the prism to our viewfinder. The moment we take a picture, the mirror flips up, the shutter opens and the light is hitting our sensor. If you have a mirrorless camera, it's the same thing just without the mirror or the optical viewfinder. The principle, however, is the same. There are four areas we can influence to get the perfect exposure, which are aperture, the speed of our shutter, the sensitivity of the sensor and, often forgotten, the actual light entering the camera. Let's say you set up your own lights in the studio, or even in bright sunlight, you can reduce the sunlight by using neutral density filters, as example. Now, I'll brush through these only quickly, but if you're interested to learn more about exposure, including exposure compensation, sensor noise, etc., etc., I'd suggest you watch last week's episode. Anyway, let's say it's a bright midday and we take a photo of this beautiful temple at the Grand Palace in Bangkok. Our camera is set to f1, a shutter speed of 1 100th of a second and an ISO of 800. Our picture will most likely look something like this. So let's start the exposure dance. I'd start with ISO and turn it as low as the camera can go. In this example, let's switch it to ISO 100. This alone, however, will not be enough. It's a bright, sunny day, so we have to change our shutter speed as well. Let's say we set it to 1 800th of a second, and let's see what we get. Ah, we're getting there. Let's now also close down our aperture and voila! we found the right exposure relatively quickly. Now, back to aperture. Where do these specific F numbers come from? Let's say we have an iris opening with a diameter of 25 millimeters, giving us an area of 490 millimeters. We've discussed that every f-stop jump up or down means that we half or double the amount of light entering the camera. This means that to double the light in this example, we have to double the area from 490 to 980. To do so, we need to calculate the new diameter by multiplying the 25 millimeters with the square root of two, 
which in this case gives us 35.3. If we now want to double the amount of light again, going from the 980 to the 1960, we have to do the same. We multiply 35.3 by the square root of 2 and get our new diameter of 50 millimeters. Let's double the aperture again, multiplying 50 millimeters by the square root of 2 and we get 70.6. As you figured out by now, there's something about this square root of 2. Now, every lens is different. Let's assume we are using this funky 85mm lens with a manual aperture ring and we get a perfect exposure at, let's say, 5.6. Now we swap the 85 with this 18 to 35mm zoom lens, which is a completely different design. First of all, it doesn't have a manual aperture ring, so you have to change it in the menus. And depending on how far we zoom in, it also has a variable aperture. All we want is to get the same exposure as with the 85 at what we said 5.6. So how does it work? Here we have our sensor, our lens with a focal length of, let's make something up, 100 millimeters, our iris and aperture and a diameter of 25 millimeters. The magic formula is focal length divided by diameter, which gives us the F number or with real numbers, assuming a focal length of our 100 mm lens, divided by 25 mm diameter equals 4, or f4. To compare, let's assume we have a 200 mm lens and an aperture opening with the same diameter of 25 mm. If we do the maths, our focal length divided by the diameter equals to 8, not 4, as we had before. So that means at the same diameter, we're not getting the same amount of light. To get the same amount of light, F4 in this case, we have to find out what the correct diameter would be. As we've learned in school, we can swap these two, which means we divide the focal length by the F number we want, which gives us the diameter. So our 200 millimeter focal length divided by a F number 4 that we want, resulting in a required diameter of 50 millimeters. And while we're on our way down this mysterious rabbit hole, let's go one step further. If we divide the focal length of a lens, let's say our 100 millimeter lens, by the diameter of the iris opening, we get the F number. Okay, we got that. So, Let's find out why these f-stops have such specific numbers and how it actually works. So let's just stick with our 100 mm focal length lens and the diameter of 25 mm. This will give us an f-number of 4, just like we had before. Let's now double the amount of light going from the 25 mm diameter to the 35.3 mm. We've seen before, to double it, we have to multiply the diameter with the square root of 2. If we do this, we need to keep the equation valid and therefore divide our f number by the square root of 2 as well. 4 divided by the square root of 2 is 2.8. So let's do this one more time just for the fun of it. Our 100 mil divided by 2.8 would give us the 35. 3 multiplied by the square root of 2 would give us a new diameter of 50. So what's our next aperture? Well, the next aperture is simply 2.8 divided by the square root of 2 and, as you guessed it, is 2.0. If we would do this one more time, we would end up with 1.4 or if we go the other way from our f4 and the area of 490, we would get 5.6, f8, F11, and there you go. So these numbers are not randomly made up. There's the maths behind it. Now you don't have to remember any of that. The important part here is that you have to remember the actual F numbers and you never have to care about what the lens is doing to give you just the amount of light that you want. So easy way to remember. You remember 1, and you remember 1.4, and you just double it from there. So 1, 2, 4, 8, 16. 
or 1.4, 2.8, 5.6, 11, rounded. There you go. You put them together and these are numbers you just have to know. So now it's time to play with Lego. So what I'm gonna do here, very simple, is I set them up in a straight line. Then we take some photos and we have a look at depth of field. So let me do this quickly. Usually they say I've prepared something earlier, but I haven't. So cut. Isn't it beautiful? <laughs> Let's quickly go through the different settings, starting at F4, 5.6, 8, 11, 16, 22, and 32. Going back to F4 and zooming in, we see the extreme shallow depth of field. In comparison, zooming out, F22 shows a much wider depth of field. Now these images were shot with a macro lens, which means the camera and lens were placed very close to our masterpiece, which further accentuates depth of field. Why this is, we're gonna see in a minute. First, however, let's start with a good glass of virtual bubbly. If we fill a glass with such a narrow shape, our liquid fills to the top and we get a certain height. Taking a second glass with a wider shape, we keep the same amount of liquid, but obviously the height has changed. So how does this relate to depth of field? It will make sense in a minute. As before, we have our sensor, iris, aperture, lens, and our focal length. In this example, as we focus on the eye of our subject, our depth of field is the area from in front and behind our focus point that we perceive as still in focus or still sharp. The size of our depth of field changes due to several factors, but as a general rule, about a third of our total depth of field is in front of our focus point and two thirds are behind. This is an important detail to remember when you're out and about shooting landscapes, as example. You always want to find a focus point about a third into your scene rather than focusing on far distant mountains, as example. So with a wide aperture, we get a certain amount of depth of field. This is the moment you have to remember our glass of bubbly. If we now close our aperture, the light spread narrows, or in our drink example, the shape of our glass becomes more narrow, which in turn extends the height of our drink, or in this case, it extends our depth of field. Now, aside from aperture size, the focal length influences depth of field as well. Now, a 25 mm lens at f2.8, as example, will create a far wider depth of field than a 200 mm lens with the same aperture. And the same applies to the distance to our subject. As we can see, as we move further away, the light spread narrows and as a result, increases our depth of field. Coming back to our Lego, the depth of field and aperture changes are quite extreme because our lens is very close to the subject. And at this distance, even at f32, not every brick is 100% in focus. That's when something like focus stacking would come into play, but I believe we reserve this for another video. Well, there you go. I think we played enough. For today, well, you can never play enough LEGO, but I hope you got a little bit of an idea how depth of field and aperture play together. And at the end of the day, you have to go out and try it for yourself. Every situation is a little bit different. If you want to know exactly, download one of those apps that you find for Android and iPhone that calculate depth of field depending on your sensor, your lens and the aperture that you pick. Well, that's it for this week. I see you again next week. And if you like what I do, why don't you click that little like button, hit subscribe, click the bell, so you get a notification when the next part or next episode comes out. Anyway, I'm off, have fun. I'll go and play some serious Lego now. See ya.